All right. Next, we want to talk about the law of sine. So we have finished how to define trigonometries in right triangles, and then using trigonometry to solve the right triangles. Now we want to solve for any kind of triangle. Okay, so that's basically what we want to do next. It doesn't have to be right triangle anymore. So the next two sections, we will be introducing the law of sine and cosine, so we will be able to solve any triangles. So let's establish what we have for law of, co uh, law of sine first. It will solve most of the cases. Okay? It all starts from a simple, simple formula we have. So from now on, let's be very specific. We name the three angles to be ABC, and we name the opposite side of three angles with the same letter, because which side we have does matter. Okay? So this will be a general setup, angle A corresponding to uh, side A, angle B corresponding to side B, to the opposite. Okay. With that in mind, now we have the area formula from before. That is, if you know two sides and angle between them, you can write down the area, which is one half, A, B, sine theta, remember, but now we need to put the corresponding sides and angle in between. But then you can do it with the same setup using this angle. So that's going to be angle C and size AB. Then similarly, it's going to be one half A and C sides and then the angle B. We have three versions of the same former or corresponding to the same area. So they are the same. Now, if you could, you try to take the first two. You start to divide on both sides on all the things you can divide out. Very quickly, one half is gone, B and B are gone. You have C sine A. Equals. And remember, keep in mind, because your B is not zero, therefore you can divide them and cancel them. And then simplify a little bit, you will see A over C. This is not the only way to, for you to write the ratio, but we write things in this way because it's pretty easy to see. So you have the corresponding sine value of the angle with the corresponding size, and this ratio is fixed for sine A and sine C. Okay. Similarly, you can try it with the last two. Okay. Put them together. Keep deleting. And arrange a little bit, it's not hard to see. Sine B over B equals sine C over C. But then you know sine C over C equals sine A over A. So finally, we have the law of cosine, uh, the law of sine. Which has a very nice symmetric relationship. That is sine A over A equals sine B over B. Hold on, we need to make sure this is a side and the capital letter corresponding to um, the angle. So this is the content of the law of sine. Very, very important. All right, with that in mind, now we have some equations that any kind of triangle has to satisfy. Do we have other equations that other um, triangles has to satisfy? Of course, we know the sum of all the angles has to be 180 degree. Now, let's pause a little bit and try to see how many information should we know in order to figure out all the information of a triangle. Okay. How many equations are there in the law of sine? There have three terms, but actually you only have two equations because you only have two equal signs. You have the first equal to the second. You have sine B over B equals sine C over C. That's two equation. You have a third one, which is sine A over A equals sine C over C. But you get it for free from the first two equations. So technically, there are only two equations here. Now with this sum of angles, you have another equation. 
So together, for any triangle, they have to satisfy three equations. All right. Now for any triangle, how many different unknowns do you have? You have three sides, you have three angles. So together, you have six variables. Three sides. Three angles. So with our notation, it's just A, B, C, and A, B, C. Now, according to what we know from algebra, your number of variables has to equal to the number of equations for you to get a unique answer. That means in order to solve all the six variables, technically, we can solve three by ourselves using the equation. So the answer is we need to know three variables. Then we will be able to solve all the other six, all the other three. So all the six, all the other three. Using, using the three equations we have. Okay, so that's the beauty of this thing. That means if you have a triangle and you have six variables, and technically you have to only know three of them, and then you can solve the other three by yourself. So knowing part of the information, you can recover all the informations using the three equations we have. That's the key. Okay, so from now on, we will start to solve triangles. We will start to solve triangles by using three informations we know to solve all the other three. Okay, and by what we just discussed here, two information will not be enough. If you only know two sides, you need one more. Okay, but if you know four information, you have known too much. You don't need that many. Okay, so three equations, uh, three variables. So how many three variables can we have? Well, number one, we can know two angle, uh, oh, sorry, we can know s three angles, but then you know, well, once you know two angles, you can get the third angle for free. So you have some redundant information. So at least you have should have one side. If you only have three angles, you only have two information. Okay, so we have two angles and one side. Let's call it, um, Let's call it A, A, S. A stands for angle, S stands for size. Okay. Case two. We may have one angle and two sides. Uh, let's talk about it first. Okay, for A, A, S, just to make sure. Okay. Let's say you know this side. What A do you know? You can know these two angles, or you can know this angle and one of the other, or maybe this case. Okay, but through symmetry, automatically you know if you flip this thing, actually this case and this case are basically the same. So we we'll only have two cases, and later we will show those both cases can be handled easily. Case two, we may have two sides and one angle. So let's say one angle and two sides. What possible, possible information can we have? Well, if we know these two sides, we may know this angle. Okay. If we know two sides, we may know this angle. Or if we have two sides, we may know this angle. Okay. Now, we will see, actually it's pretty easy to see. You only have two cases because these two cases are kind of similar through symmetry. You either know the angle between these two sides or you know an angle other than the angle in between these two sides. So we are going to call this one SSA case, and we are going to call, going to call this one SAS case. Okay, the reason is very simple. Okay, that is both, um, sorry, the classification is very simple. You either have the angle in between these two sides, you know, or you have the angle which is some angle other than this. It can either be this corner or this corner, okay? The reason we differentiate them is because they need to be handled differently. The law of sine can handle this in this section. For this, we need the law of cosine, which is the next section. Okay. Now the third case, what do you have? Well, you have one, ang uh, one angle, two sides, 
two angle one side now you have a three sides you don't know a single angle you only know these three lengths so somehow you want to figure out what these angles are for this we definitely need the law of cosine okay we call it sss case and we need the law of cosine So for this section, we will basically focus our energy on the first case, when you know two angle and a side, and on the second case, when you know two sides and an angle, and the angle is not in between. Okay, we will first solve these two. Some people may differentiate even further. For this one, they call it AAS. For this one, they call it ASA, simply because you know the sides between these two angles. But really, if you know two A, Okay, you technically know the third A because you can simply just find the third angle using 180 degree minus the other two angles. So even though we have two cases here, but you can easily convert from one case to the other. Okay, so we don't want to differentiate these two cases too much because once you know two angle, you actually know the third angle. So it really doesn't matter which two you know. Okay, but let's focus on them one by one. So we have three cases. Of solving triangle. The first one is ASA. Let's see a quite easy example. So we see a triangle. We know this is 45. We know this is 30. We know this is um, 5. Now solve the triangle. Now, before we do anything, we need to give them names. So let's call this one A, let's call this one B, and C. It doesn't really matter, actually, how you name them. But now our job is to try to figure out the three things. Angle C, side A, and side B. What tools do we have? We have the three equations we had before. The law of cosine and also the sum of the triangles. The angles in the triangles will be 180. From here, you can see easily, you can get this to be 180 minus A minus B, which is so that's what I said once you know two angle the third angle is really easy to get okay. once you have that you have three angles now you just need to write down the law of sine Now, good news. For one of them, you do know it's 5. Now, if you know 30, of course you know sine 30. If you know 45, of course you know sine 45. So actually, you know every single value here, here, and here, and here. Now your job is to try to solve for A and B. That's pretty easy to do. Okay. So let's take the first and the third. Sine 45 degree over A equals sine 105 degree over 5 then a equals 5 sine 45 degree divided by sine 105 degree now use a calculator you can easily figure out what that is so mm. Five times sine forty five degree divided by sine uh, one oh five degree. The answer is going to be point six six. Okay. Now same thing for B. This time just assign sine 30 degree over B equals sine 105 degree over 5. Or you can use the first one since you already got A. Okay. B equals 5 sine 30 degree divided by sine 105 degree. Then 
use a calculator. We see this one is roughly 2.588. So starting from two angles on one side, we were able to figure out the first third angle first. Then through the law of sine, we will be able to figure out the other two sides. It's quite easy. Doesn't matter if you have AAS case or ASA case, because whichever case you have, right away, okay, you will find the third A. So you always have the A, 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 S case, technically, because no matter you have ASA or AAS, you can get the third A right away. Okay, so let's put these two cases together. ASA or AAS, they are the same. Okay, so what's special about this one? What's special about this one is actually the law of sine. If you have AAS, that means what? That means once you have two angles, automatically you know everything here, here, and here for free. Now, in order to continue, remember you have AAS. The S stands for you definitely know one of them. Maybe you know A, maybe you know B, maybe you know C. But once you know that, you compare these two, you will find, okay, I have equation. I know everything about the two angles on one side. There's only one side that I don't know. So you can always solve it, as long as you know one side, because you already know all the sine value. That's why AAS is pretty easy to solve. Okay, so that's the first case. Actually, they're the same case, like I said. Once you know AA or ASA, you know the third A. The second case is a little bit trickier. It's called SSA. So let's be very careful to stay away from SAS. And let's see what we have. I prepared three examples. Okay. And let's try to compare them and try to see the difference. The first one is A equals 2 and B equals square root of 2. And let me give it a name, 1. Okay, A equals 45. Solve the right triangle. I solve the triangle. Okay. The first one, let's draw it. Try to be as accurate as you can. Sometimes that will reveal some information that you don't uh, observe if you don't draw them carefully. Okay. So roughly I have um, A, B, C. If you don't like this, you can of course put B here, but really you're just flipping the whole uh, right tri uh, the triangle. So it doesn't matter which way you draw it. All right, now let's write down what we know. We know sine A over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. And try to see, I stay away from the two sides. Otherwise, this angle will be the one angle in between. Okay, it's SAS case. That's the law of sine. Now I'll write down what we know. We know this is 2. We know this is uh, square root of 2. We know this is 45. Let me do it in this clever way. Now, can you go ahead and try to solve the equation? Well, you notice if you take the first two, you know 1, 2, 3, 4. The only thing you don't know is sum b. So, this is definitely doable now. You cannot get B right away, but you can first solve for sine B. Mm. Yeah, divide by two. Okay, and luckily we got a 
easy triangle. So that is going to be square root of 2 times, which is 1 half. Okay. So far, so good. And now you can see why we went over all the trouble okay, of solving inverse trigonometry. Because now you know sine b equals 1 half. What is b? Well, number one, sine inverse 1 half is a very strong candidate. But then you need to ask yourself one thing. Remember, you have multiple answers. You really need to know where b is. Okay? Because if you think about sine in terms of 1 half, this will work, this will work, this will work, this will work. Even if these two are negatives for sine, these two are still possible. Right? So what you need to write down is actually all the possible ones. So let's draw it carefully. If B is in the right is in a triangle, what do you know? You know B is between zero and uh, and one hundred eighty, right? So starting from there, we are going to draw this. We technically have four, but we only need these two. These two we don't need it because it's beyond the zero to pi. Now, if I think about one half, thirty degrees is certainly one choice. For sine, you have positive, positive. And you have to say, well, 150 degree, which give you another 30 degree here, is also a possible choice, which is legit for a triangle because it's less than 180. Meanwhile, if you take the sine of 150, you do have one half positive, right? So you have two possible values. Don't just simply say it's 30. You do have two choices. Okay. Now, do you go with both answer? You can either try to draw it or try to see if that thing creates any trouble. Well, if B is 40, a 30, you will have something just as I draw 30. Right? That will work. Great. If B is 150, what's going to happen? You're going to have something like this with a 45. You're going to have another 150, and you cannot form a triangle. What's the reason? The reason is because this plus this is already 195, which is bigger than 180. There's no room for a third one, third angle. So even though you have both answer, automatically you should cross this out. And the reason is because 150 plus 40, 5, is bigger than 180. So this is not possible since you already have a 45. Therefore, B is 30. Okay. So we went through all the trouble. We find B equals 30. That's the first one. Now, if you check this one, law of sine, you have sine A over 2 equals sine B over square root of 2 equals sine C over C. Now, through all the trouble we have done so far, we were able to figure out this was actually 30 degree. Now, in order to figure out the capital C or the small c, we definitely need to know one of them. So my question here is, knowing everything we know so far, can you find this or this? Which way? Think about it. And I think it's not hard to see. Once you know two angle, where you find one of the angle by yourself, okay? The third angle is super easy because, because they sum together equals 180. And once you know this is 105, the last one is very easy to do. To do. Sine 30 degree over square root of 2 equals. The only thing I don't know is C at the side. So no. Uh, sine 30. So we can easily find it. divided by sine 30, which is roughly 2.73. Okay, we have one side, we have one angle, we have the other angle, so mission complete. All right, that's the SSA case. So if you know two sides, 
And if you know one of the angle, okay, then of course you can solve the sine of this one and then use sine trig inverse to find the angle. But once you have two angles, you can find the third angle and then you can find the size. It's some procedure which is very, very redundant every time you solve it. You can either memorize it or you can just simply go with um, the case and try to see for which one I have a complete solution with only one variable. Once I have that, I can go ahead and solve. So that's case one. Okay, SSA. One thing worth noticing is for SSA, you will be able to use the two sides at one angle to solve a sine value. And once you have a sine value to find the angle using trig inverse, because it's a sine and your angle is between zero to pi, you actually have two possible values for your angle. For this case, we got lucky. We got lucky because one of them is not legit. But then you need to start to ask yourself, maybe sometimes it's legit that you may have two possible solutions. Okay, for some times, two possible solutions, one of them is bad. But in general, because you will always have two solutions when you do this trig inverse for sine, it's possible to have two solutions. So let me make this one to be very specific. This is the one solution case because we toss out one of the possibilities. Then maybe sometimes, sometimes we may have a two solution case. Okay, this time, time let's take A to be 1.2, b to be square root of 2, and a to be 4.5, a 45 degree. Okay, so now let's draw it. Note, I draw it a little bit differently because this time, this one is technically shorter. Before this was a two, now it's 1.2, so it's a little bit shorter. Okay, now how do you do it? I think you already have the, the trick exactly the same way. This is my plan. I know A, I know B, I know capital A, 45 degree. So of course I can solve for sine B. Now of course I can solve for B. Once I have B, I have AB, I can solve for C. And once I have sine C, I can solve for C. So very standard. And let's repeat the process. As always, our sine B is going to be this is not an easy number, so let's try to hold on, sine forty five degree divided by one point two. Which is roughly point eight three three three. Okay. Now it's time for us to do B. What I will do is I will put sine inverse B here. Now, if sine inverse b equals this for b between 0 and pi, you know this is one choice. This will be the other choice, which is going to be 180 minus 56.544. So, or b does have two possibilities, the first one or the second one. Mm, that's going to be... You can do the math. Okay, I will just write it down. 124, 23.56 degree. As before, we have two possible answers. Okay, 
before we were able to cross one of them out because this one plus a 45 degree is bigger than 180. It's not possible. But this time, you can check for both cases. The first one is like what I just drew. Roughly 56. Let's just use the, let's round a little bit less digits to make it look nicer. But of course you can do the, do it with more digits. And then this is going to be some angle. The other one before, okay, let's draw it carefully. You have a 45. Before we have a 150 something, which is beyond, right? So the whole thing is like that. There's no triangle, but this time it's possible. It's not pretty, but it's possible. Why? Because 125 and another 45 degree, you still have a room. This is 169. You still have a room of 11 degree. So technically, this one is also possible. So that's why I say if there's no way to rule them out, for this case, we do have a two solution case. You have to keep both. Therefore, starting from here, you actually need to write your answer in two possible cases. Case one, B equals 56 degree. Try to finish. C. Oh, I will just do it really quickly. Minus 45, minus 56, 101, so 79 degree. That gives us one point six six. Okay, and this gave us a triangle which looked like this. I will skip the sides, but you know roughly the shape. Okay. Now, of course, like we argued, the other case is also possible. Okay. Then what do you have? You do have um, Then you repeat the same thing, but this time replace your sine C to be sine 11 degree. I will skip. You can do it. Point three two. Okay. Corresponding to another case which is like that. And both are possible. Therefore, you have a two solution case. Okay. And there is no way we can tell which one is which. Why is that? It's pretty easy to think about. Remember, you know two sides, right? You know this is going to be square root of two. You know this is going to be 45. And you do know that the next one is going to be 1.2. But now, for this case, it's either this one or this one. And from here, you can see you does have two possible cases because both of them give you 1.2, 45 degree and square root of 2. And there is really no way for you to tell is this one better or this one better because they are both possible. That's why we have two possible cases. Okay. Why we don't have this before? The reason is this. 
If you know this side, you know this side. You know this angle. Okay. If this is square root of 2, you kind of... How many solutions you have it really depends on how many, how long the third side is. Okay. If it's just this long, you have two possible cases, of course. If this one is very long, you have two possible cases. One is like that, one is like that. But then automatically you know this one cannot be included. It's already beyond okay, what you can do there, right? It's not a triangle anymore. You don't have an angle here, the angle is instead here. So from here you can see when do you have uh, two solutions or one solution? And it really depends on how long this is. Um, when do you think the problem will occur? The problem will occur exactly when this one is also square root of 2. Because if you flip this one, you have exactly these two overlap each other. If you just take the equal possibility with the other side. Kind of makes sense here. But if it's a little bit shorter than that, you will always have room to do this and do the flipped one. And this one is still to the right side of this side. But if this one is as long as this one, it become here. And then if you go even further, this one is definitely not be going to be possible. So what you have here is you have two possible cases. You have two possible cases when this side is short and you have only one case if this side is long. And where do they differentiate? The side you're looking for is exactly square root of 2, which is the same side as what you have for b. Longer than that, you have one case. Shorter than that, you have um, two cases. All right. Now, of course, that brings us to a third one. That is, is it possible that you don't have a solution at all? Very easy. What if your a is super short? Just like that. No matter you go this way, no matter you go that way, you will never be able to actually touch the third side. Then you have no solution. So that's the third case. Two solution, one solution, and the no solution case will be your thing is just too short. I still want this to be 45, but I want my a to be 0.1, then there's no way this one can touch it. Okay. And what do you think? the threshold will be, how short will be that you can just have a solution, but beyond that, you cannot have a solution. That will be this case, which you can easily do. It's one and one. If your A is a little bit shorter than one, if you're a little bit longer than that, you will have two possible cases, right? Okay. If you are just one, you have exactly the case. You go to the left, go to the right. You actually go all goes to the perpendicular case. But if you are shorter than one, that means you are not even enough to touch the thing with the shortest distance, not to mention if you go this way or that way, you will never touch it because your best chance is actually the perpendicular one. So if you are less than that, we should have no solution. And we can easily make an example like that. Okay, that is when you have a third case. We're expecting it to be a no solution case. We kind of get what it means. That means your A is very short, one half, for example. Your B is going to be uh, square root of two, as always. And your A is going to be 45 degree. You can still draw it hypothetically. And you will see you will have trouble, which is good, right? Because technically, it's not doable. We're still here. 45 degree. Okay. Mm hmm. Sign B. We do know this. So your B should be, be corresponding to sine inverse one, uh, sine inverse two, and maybe some possible other ones. Use a calculator.
and you will find this is undefined. Wait a second. Why is that? And soon you will notice, oh, actually, if you're talking about sine value, it should be less or equal than one, right? There's no way your opposite is going to be longer than the hypotenuse. So this over that is always less or equal to one. Therefore, there's no way we can have something like that. This is not possible. And because this is not possible, this is not possible, this equals two. Therefore, therefore there's no triangle satisfying the setup you just had. So no solution. All right, so we spent so much time talking about the SSA case. We have three possible outputs. According to the drawing, it really depends on, okay, it really depends on how long the side is, because if it's too short, you cannot touch it. If it's too long, you only have one solution. You have two, you have two possible ways to touch, to keep the angle, to keep the sides, meanwhile, to keep the third side to be the same. Okay, so of course we have three cases, great. But if you think about how we solve the triangle, you don't have to remember any of this. All you need to remember is just go ahead and solve for sine b. Okay? Then what can be happening? Happening. Number one, sine b is bigger than one, so no solution. Number two, sine b is less than one, so you have two possible solutions. But once you figure that out, you find one of the angles is too big, like the case one. So you can toss out the one of the angles, okay? leaving you only one possibility. Number three, maybe you have two possible cases, and if you check it, you find, well, they both work. Then you have two cases. So actually, you don't have to know anything about what we just draw here in geometry. You just remember one thing. That is, if you're trying to solve this trig inverse of sine b, you do have two possible solutions. After that, just check your solution and see if they apply. If they don't, cross out one. So that's the beauty of analytical geometry. You don't have to know the shape. You just follow what you know about algebra. All right, that will be the SSA case. By the way, we said we can also for SA as case. You can easily try that. Let's say if you know A is 45 degree, you know this is 2, this is square root of 2. Can you solve the triangle? Okay, sine A over A equals sine b over b equals sine c over c. But this time we do have a s a s case. Now put the numbers into the right position. Now you see the trouble. You have three terms. Each one, you only know one of them. That means if you set these two together, you have two variables, which you cannot solve. You need one variable, right? If you set these two together, you only have, again, two variables. So no matter how you set them up, you will be short of one variable. That is why you cannot solve it. Not like before. Before, you know this side. Therefore, in this complete thing, you only have one unknown, which is B. So you do know that when you have two sides and one angle, which sides you know and which angle you know does matter. For this, we need to use the law of cosine. Similarly for the SSS case, that means you have sine A over A equals sine B over B. C over C. And you know these three numbers. Again, it's the same trick. You know one of each. So no matter how you set up the equations, you will always have, always have more than one unknown, which you cannot do. That's why, again, we need the law of cosine. Okay, that's for later. Number four, very quickly, we want to talk a little bit about the application. Why in real life you want to solve for triangles? The reason is because in real life, a lot of shapes are in triangles. You can be the relation of the locations, you can be velocities, you can be you're building a roof, which looks like this. You have a mountain, you have an incline, Okay, with a tower, whatever. You see triangles everywhere. So of course you want to solve for triangles. Then how do you get all the information of the triangles? First, you can measure all the six things. Sometimes, number one, it's, it's going to be expensive. And you need to spend a lot of work to measure more. 
Number two, sometimes something is impossible to measure. Okay, then it will be super nice if you could measure the ones which are easy to measure and get the ones which are hard to measure using just solving the triangles. Okay, maybe these two sides are super easy to measure, and this one is super dangerous to measure. It's on a cliff. Then how about we just measure these two and then solve the third one without measuring it? That's where the application is. All right. You can see many, many ones from the textbook problem and also the end of chapter problems. So I will just go over one example. To let you see, this is actually quite useful. We're talking about a height of a hot balloon or airplane. So you have a hot balloon floating in the air. You wonder how high that thing is. Okay. So one thing you can do is you can actually stand on the ground. And we have done this before, right? You stand on the ground. Here's you. You look at this hot balloon and you got an angle of elevation. Now, if you want to know the height, you just need to know the other side. So this is H, let's say this is A, this is a 30, let's say, for example, it's 45 degree, if you look at it. Then, as long as you know this side, you can solve the height through the trigonometry. But can you see why it's, it, it is difficult? It's not difficult to measure distance on the ground, but it's really difficult to make sure that you're right below the hot balloon. Right? How do you know that you're right below the hot balloon? Moreover, this balloon may be floating to the right or to the left. It's moving. So it's really hard for you to track and measure at the same time. So this is actually very difficult. That means a right triangle is impossible. Then, how about we do this? We set another guy, a second guy, who is here, and let him look at the balloon at the same time. So even though this one is floating, maybe the bottom is actually moving all the time. But we can set up our watch and say, hey, let's look at the balloon at 12 o'clock. And you got another angle of elevation. Sounds good. So this is the first guy, this is the second guy. And number three, this guy doesn't have to move. You just need to know the angle. So we can actually measure the distance between us ahead of time, let's say five miles. Okay, so you don't have to actually move as the, as the, as the balloon move because when the balloon move, you simply just change your angle. You don't have to actually move. Like if you want to be at exactly the bottom, you have to move, right? But if this one moved to here, you simply just just look at it again and got a, two, a different set of angles. So this distance between you guys can actually always stay the same. No matter how the balloon is moving. You can even build a station at these two places. Now the question is, if you know at one time, two person, five miles away, looking at the same balloon, one got a 45 degree and the other one got 60 degree of angle of elevation, let's find the height of the balloon. That is very practical, and you can try it by yourself. You can even use that thing to measure an airplane if you have a really accurate uh, angle measurement, and uh, you can do it at the same time. But nonetheless, if you really just try to draw it, can you see, number one, it's a very, very easy triangle problem with 45 degree and 60 degree and five, so A as A case. Using the law of cosine, a uh, law of sine, I will, it will be very easy for me to find this and that. Good, but that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for the height. Now, can you see um, how we do it? Well, once we know A or B, you can either pick the right triangle in the left or the tri right triangle on the right. Then just solve a right triangle after this to find H. So it's settled. Step one, find A or B. I will just pick A. Step two, uh, solve this right triangle. Once you know A, find H. Okay. First one, sine A over A equals sine B over B. By the way, you don't actually have to solve A, B, C all the time. This time we only need A, so we technically don't need B. So we don't have to do this. We just need to do sine C over C. 
A, you don't know, fine. This angle is 60. This is 5. You just need sine C or C. Do you know C? Well, you know A and B, so C. And knowing that, you will be able to do this. So we found A. Now once you know A, how do you find H? Well, step two, H over A is sine 45 degree. Therefore, H is going to be A times sine 45. But then we know A. Without a calculator, you still know these two values. So simplify a little bit. And up to now, we don't have anything better other than using a calculator. OK, but before that, knowing 60 degree and 45 degree, we can still proceed further. So for the exam, you can stop here. But for um, a calculator, <laughs> roughly 3.17 miles. So answer. The height of the balloon is 3.17 miles. By the way, I haven't mentioned it before. So every time you start to answer a word problem, you will need to put your answer in words. Just imagine you're communicating with some people who does not know math. They just come here and they say, can you tell me the height? So your answer you give them should be, here's the height. Okay, they probably don't have the capacity to read all the mathematical expressions you have. So you need to give them an explicit answer in words. So this is a requirement in all the work you need to show in the exams and the quizzes and the homeworks. Okay, so make sure you always put your answer in words. If you were given a word problem because you're basically having a client who knows nothing about mathematics and asking you for help. Okay, so the answer you put here in words is basically equivalent to a report. Okay, a report with all the steps you have in English written uh, format. Okay, so put your answer in words. All right, this is just a very, I would say, easy, but it's a very that's actually, it's a pretty easy to solve problem for the law of sine, but it does solve a very important real life uh, problems. That is, how do you test the height of a hot balloon without having to be tracking the balloons to be exactly under the balloon to use the right triangle? You just need two station for you to observe and you need two angles at the same time. Moreover, before you can actually measure the distance between the two stations because the stations are not moving. So you can reuse that information all the time. Sounds good. Another thing you can think about it is this. You can use a station here. You can use a station here. Then you, you all look at the same thing at the same time. In this case, a hot balloon. To measure this angle here and this angle here, you will be able to solve the height. That is beautiful. Now what if this is the sun? You can go to one city, look at the sun, try to find the angle. You can go to the other city, look at the sun to find the angle. You probably want these two places to be very far away from each other so you can see a slightly different difference in the angle of elevations because you know the sun is very far, far away. 
Using this one, you can find the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Which is exactly the same way you find uh, the height of a hot balloon. It's because the only difference is just like maybe this time you have the, the stations has to be very far away from each other. Maybe you need to adjust that the thing is actually not straight because the Earth is not flat. And finally, you probably need a very accurate uh, measurements of the angles because you know the, the differences are going to be very, very slight. But it's doable. Okay, you do the same thing. Actually, you can estimate how far you are from a satellite, the height of a satellite, the height of the moon, and everything that you can measure using the same sim simple method. Of course, it's not going to be accurate, but it's going to be pretty good. Okay. By the way, if you are wondering, how do you measure this angle of elevation when you look at the sun? You actually don't look at the sun. You just put a stick here. You can do better, of course, but you just put a stick here and let the sun just go and shine, and you can measure the shadow. Once you know the shadow and the height of the stick, which is not very long to measure, you will be able to figure out this angle of elevation. Okay, so you don't have to actually look at the sign, sun, uh, the same way you you look at the balloon. You just you know measure it in all kinds of clever ways. All right, to wrap things up, we have the law of sine, which is very easy. We know three things. We find the other three to solve a triangle. We solve the ASA, AAS case, which is two angle and a side. We solve the SSA case. We cannot solve the angle in between, and we cannot solve the three sides case. For that, we need the law of cosine. So these two are the leftovers, which we will cover in the next section. After that, all solving triangle problem can be solved.